I was asked to talk a little bit about impact evaluation approaches, um, and then, which I'm going to do, and then um, I'll focus on the, the Vietnam study and the findings there, and hopefully throughout the talk I want to talk, you know, emphasize the policy issues. Okay, there's been a lot of interest in roads and their impacts in recent years um, with a lot of different approaches that people have followed um, as well as a lot of different questions asked. Uh, I think that uh, when I was thinking or starting to think about this in around 1996, a lot of other people were starting to think about how little we knew and started research because suddenly there's a lot of papers on, on, um, on rural roads. What I want to talk about today is ex post impact evaluation of rural road improvements. Okay, um, I think given how many different approaches there are and, and different objectives uh, to the research, it can be quite confusing. And so I think it's useful to define what um, I'm going to talk about and um, how do, I, how, how do I define the, the topic? Well, first of all, by rural roads, I mean small local roads or, or paths, uh, tracks in rural areas that have low or no motorized uh, traffic volumes. Um, let's say low motorized traffic volumes. Typically, they link up villages with other villages or villages with the road network, as, as Schengen mentioned. And they're expected to have local impacts. Okay? Um, by improvements, I mean new road construction as well as rehabilitation. Ex post, I mean evaluation of impacts after an intervention has occurred, okay, and hopefully has had time to have impacts. And finally, by impact evaluation, I mean establishing causality and net impacts of interventions that are assigned to specific units. Yeah, that is, you can, you can say that they're, they're assigned to this community or these households as opposed to these, these other ones, okay? And so um, in that case, you can use, you can uh, establish the causality through ex post counterfactual analysis, okay? Now this approach isn't appropriate in all situations. Um, what we study or what I'm gonna talk about is really small local rural road improvements for which classic evaluation tools are appropriate. Okay, so there are non-assigned units, whether households or communities, that did not get the intervention and that can represent the counterfactual of what would have happened without the intervention. Okay, so I'm not going to talk about um, highways and long-distance trunk roads that join up regions and often uh, uh, country, countries. Um, and that tend to have, you know, impacts on wages and prices and macroeconomic effects and are not assigned to specific communities. Um, I'm not going to talk about the assumptions and the models that are used in those cases instead of the non-assigned units to infer the counterfactual. Um, now, there are many different kinds of approaches. Um, and I, I, for one, find it quite difficult to classify them. And, and there's always questions about, you know, how do the approaches differ? Are they ans answering the same questions? Are their findings consistent? And so I find it useful to, to, to think about how, how, would, how I would um, make the difference between them and impact evaluations and classify them. Now, I, I, this may be very bold to do at IFPRI because a lot of these other approaches have been done by people at IFPRI. Um, and so um, I, if anybody has a better way of classifying or making the distinction, I'm, I'm very, very open to it. Um, but for me, it helps. So I think of, of these different approaches as really structural form models that identify impacts on the basis of economic assumptions about how things work, yeah? Um, and they rely heavily on a specific model of behavior, usually with clear economic um, assumptions. Now, as I said, a lot of this work has, has come, out, come out of IFPRI. Um, and I, I, I can think of three, three different categories. One, CGE models. Uh, in which roads are modeled as exogenous transport cost savings, so you infer everything from the general equilibrium conditions. 
A second group um, that, that Schengen and other colleagues here at, at IFPRI have, have contributed a lot to would be macro-style simultaneous equation econometric models of the economy. And these typically look at impacts on economic growth, on poverty reduction, but at the, at the economy-wide level. Um, I, I think of them as, as a bit of, as impacts of the commu cumulative past road spending. Yeah? And typically, they're estimated um, with regional data and time series, time series data. And then, of course, there's the micro-partial equilibrium um, structural models that typically have used farm household models uh, to estimate impacts of reduced transport costs through, through roads. Okay, and again, um, Bart Minton, Minton of IFPRI has, has worked on this with uh, Hanan Jacobi of the World Bank. Um, the, the, there are a lot of people have done this, but I think these, the Jacobi uh, 2001 and Jacobi and Minton 2007 are, are some uh, recent key examples of this. Now, the downside of, of these really is that assumptions have to be uh, plausible and, and um, they may not be may not be empirically testable. Um, the upside, of course, is that there are gains in terms of, of what we can learn um, uh, as long as the assumptions are valid. Now, in contrast, impact evaluation is, is highly atheoretical and, um, and basically a reduced form. Yeah, there's often very little we can understand about why we have impacts, why the, what chant through what are the channels through which roads are having impacts? Okay, there's ways of looking at intermediate outcomes and so on to, to get a better feel for that, but often that's rather limited. Okay, so the, those are some of the differences. Now, I, I really think that the two types of approaches are extremely complementary, uh, in part because they're asking different questions and looking at very different things. Okay, what are the differences in the, uh, these approaches? Well. Um, Macro-structural models focus on, on, as I said, the cumulative effect of many past road expenditures, um, but not on specific development projects. Um, given the, the many identifying assumptions of the structural models, um, it's of interest, I think, to see instead what happens with a specific project in a specific place. Um, economy-wide models used for studying economy-wide road investments, but I think are going to be much too blunt to look at, again, the very local impacts. And the micro um, partial equilibrium models um, help for small projects, but they require behavioral assumptions um, and focus on a very narrow set of outcomes and channels by which roads influence outcomes. Um, Okay, so what are the key policy questions for impact evaluation studies? Um, there are probably more than, than what I've listed, but um, I think a key question is whether improved roads um, that link poor isolated rural areas with, with uh, markets and, and the rest of the economy actually do promote local development and reduce poverty. Yeah, I mean, there's arguments that are made that in, it could, they could instead displace uh, development. People now can reach uh, a bigger market town and they, they migrate out, for example. Um, uh, a very important question, policy question, is what are the contingent factors that, that, that help roads have impacts, that Im influence the impacts? And related to this, you know, what are the distributional uh, impacts of roads and what factors um, help roads be pro-poor. Yeah. So, you know, the key questions really are, are there household and, and community characteristics that, that produce higher impacts of roads? Um, now, related to this, of course, is, is whether there are complementary public policies or investments that should go alongside roads in, in order to make sure that they have the impacts that, that we would like, okay, and help the poor as well. And finally, um, very, a very useful product of, of impact evaluations of roads could be uh, the implications for ex-ante evaluation of, of road investments. Um, 
the donors, such as the World Bank, uh, do a lot of uh, road investments. The, they do cost-benefit analysis in, in an extremely Mickey Mouse way. I mean, it's actually shocking. Um, and so I think the more we learn about, you know, what are the factors locally that, that increase the impacts of roads and, and so on, the more those things can feed into uh, the ex-ante evaluation of rural roads. Now, what do we know? Um, I think our intuition and the general consensus is that roads are good for, for development and for living standards. Um, development policy discussions typically emphasize the linkages between a reduction in transport costs, increases in trade, uh, changes in prices, shifts in production structures so that there's both a, an increased specialization and diversification of income sources off farm, um, and eventually higher living standards. Uh, so you can think of it kind of as transport-induced local market development. Okay, but there's really surprisingly little evidence uh, um, for this, or on the size of these impacts, on the nature of the benefits, and again, on the, on the contextual factors that, that influence outcomes, um, outcomes at the local level. Um, now, why is this? Well, in part because there's some very difficult methodological issues in assessing impacts rigorously. It's a number of sources of bias. Um, this is true of, of all, most policies, but I, I think in, in some ways they're uh, more intractable with respect to, to rural roads. Um, as we all know, um, policy placement uh, is not random. Um, governments don't just uh, randomly assign roads. They, there's reasons for where they place roads, and it's very likely, highly likely, in fact, that the factors that lead to a road being placed in a certain area also affect um, outcomes, okay? And so unless the comparison areas, the counterfactual, have the same factors, you're gonna have biased impact estimates. Um, selection bias is gonna occur if, if there's some reason that roads are poor in you know, the participating uh, areas and being compared with places that don't have those same factors. Um, so, we typically do, you know, we just um, rely on double differences where we do a before and after plus a with and without to get rid of, of um, endogeneity. But this is not enough in a context where a lot of the initial conditions may, be, may, may affect the trajectory that, uh, uh, of, of communes so that there are time varying um, initial conditions that, that, that uh, will not be purged uh, with a double difference, okay? Um, so failure to adequately control for initial conditions that lead to the road placement can generate very large biases uh, in estimates of impacts. And finally, I think we're increasingly realizing that endogeneity can also arise uh, if the changes in placement are a function of, of latent time varying factors. For example, if new roads are built in places that are growing faster for reasons, um, you know, other unobserved reasons that we, we're not control, controlling for and that are correlated with placement as well, okay? So, it's, very important to have very good data and very uh, sophisticated methods, uh, and so uh, this is rarely the case and is one reason we, we don't know much. Uh, at a minimum, I think um, it's totally necessary to have panel data with a baseline. I'm very pessimistic about doing impact evaluation without um, um, panel data. Um, a comparison group, it's important to allow for the factors that influence both the program placement and the outcomes. Also, whether they are time varying or time invariant. Um, you also need to allow for any exogenous time varying factors that happen, shocks and so on. And it's important to allow for the time um, for impact, the, the time it's necessary for impacts to emerge. Um, typically, impact evaluations of rural roads don't wait long enough 
for, for impacts to emerge. And it's possible that the short-term impacts could be quite different from the longer-term impacts. Okay, so there's been a, n a number of impact evaluation approaches. Um, most recent studies, I mean, when I say this, I, you know, people have looked at roads for, for a long, long, long time, but I'm, I'm really talking about recent ones that, that uh, take more, more account of these endogeneity issues and so on. Um, so there have been um, most recent studies use double difference combined with, uh, with other methods to deal with the initial conditions that, that affect the, the trajectory of, of, um, of impacts. Uh, so the double difference deals with the additive time invariant initial conditions and these other things deal with uh, the, uh, the time varying um, factors. Okay, so there's um, a double difference combined with propensity score matching. Um, this is what I'll talk about later and there's another paper by Lokshin and Yemtsov on Georgia. Um, that does this. Another method used has been to combine double difference with instrumental variables. Um, it's going to be very unusual that you can find an instrumental variable, but um, Gibson and Rosell argue that they've, they've found a, a good one. It, that, that's for um, PNG, Papua New Guinea. And then um, double difference with controls for initial conditions through OLS. And there's a recent paper by Kanker and others um, coming out in EDCC that, that does this for Bangladesh. Now, a, 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 a somewhat different approach um, is to use dynamic panel data models. And here, you're really looking at the impacts on consumption and poverty uh, reduction. Um, and you can look at initial assignment of roads or changes in roads over time. Now, the key thing here is that you really uh, need at least three waves of a panel to be able to do this uh, uh, adequately. And so it's very rare to find this kind of data, um, and certainly with information on changes in, in, in uh, access to roads. Um, but there's a number of examples, uh, including the work that um, Durkan and people here uh, at IFPRI have been doing in Ethiopia. Okay, all, all these methods assume non-random placement. Uh, well, what about, you know, randomizing placement? Uh, I just really don't think that that would ever be feasible. Um, but uh, we, we can discuss that if you're, if you're interested. Um, so let, turning to the Vietnam study. Um, this study basically aims to contribute uh, to our, our understanding of these issues um, by evaluating the impacts of a World Bank financed railroad rehabilitation project that was implemented in 18 provinces of Vietnam um, between 1997 and 2001. Um, we collected a panel data of communes in, in project and non-project areas. Um, there's a pre-intervention baseline and post-project follow-up. And so the day is pretty good uh, and allows a, a rigorous uh, test of, of project impacts and, and their heterogeneity. The key question really is, again, whether new roads or improved roads that link these poor uh, communes, uh, poor rural communes in Vietnam to the rest of the economy basically promote local market development. And, you know, it's usually assumed to be the case but um, I think that, in theory, um, a road could, could increase or decrease market development. There's really no presumptions that roads will encourage, encourage it. Um, we're revising this paper, so I'm, I feel a bit sort of in between an old version, which um, I, I sent to you, and a new version that's somewhat different. Um, but the, in the new version, we've really reduced the outcomes, the number of outcomes we look at, and focus much more on market development. And we've developed a s simple model um, that really shows that the impacts of better roads on the development of local markets is theoretically ambiguous. Um, just, you know, very quickly that we're still working on this model, but 
Um, whether a market exists or not is going to depend on the cost advantage of a, of a commercial carrier that carries, you know, goods from the central market to the commune and, and back um, versus the value of time of residence. Yeah? And in the model, so the, the, time, the value of time of residence that would themselves be going to the central market and bringing back goods. Um, <coughs> the value of time is going to be, depend a lot on the characteristics of the residents and their communes um, so that poorer communes have a lower value of time and richer communes have a higher value of time. And there's also a complex, complex interaction with the distance to the market town yeah, and, and then how the project affects uh, travel time. So all these things together and basically the, the, the model, you know, appears to um, show that, that, that it's ambiguous, basically. Um, and the, the poorer the commune, the more likely the project is going to promote market development. Um, and where, while in rich areas that are likely to have markets uh, to begin with, the value of time is high, so the market is going to come to them initially, but the road the uh, improvement may well displace the market. So it's now cheaper to go to the central market. Um, okay. So that's just um, quickly just to say that, that it is ambiguous, that there is a question here uh, to look at. Okay. Um, so what are, what are the evaluation questions? Well, the first is that um, is what are the average impacts uh, of rural road improvements on local area and market development? Um, how long does it take for impacts to emerge? We've got data for 2001 and 2003. In 2001, there was, it was about an average of 27 months since um, the projects had been completed. Um, and then, of course, 2003 is two years later. Um, that's the first set of questions. Second set of questions is about the, the heterogeneity in impacts across communes. Do we find that there's a lot of differences in the impacts? Um, and what is it that explains this difference uh, if we do find it? Um, we certainly expect impacts to vary according to the economic, the social, and, and political characteristics of, of communes and the, the households that live there. Um, and so and there's a number of, I think, important policy questions. First, whether higher levels of initial development actually enhance or, or diminish impacts. Is it the case that, that if a commune already has, you know, good conditions, um, you're going to have more impacts? Uh, one can make an argument that way, and one can make the opposite argument that you know the, the places that need the roads the most are, are going to benefit the most. Um, and in practice, road project selection often often favors poor areas with very uh, not only with poor road conditions, um, but with with like it's likely very poor conditions of of everything else. Um, so if if poor road conditions coincide with other bottlenecks to market development, such as you know, poor uh, low population densities, poor agroclimatic endowments, um, you know, malfunctioning markets or a lack of, of credit and, and other markets, low education, no, and you can think of all sorts of things. Um, you know, what happens then? I mean, are, are roads going to have, have impacts in those, in those circumstances? And the policy issue, I think, is, is one, should we be building roads there? And secondly, should, should we have complementary uh, policies to go with the roads if that's the case? Finally, the, the third set is, uh, if we do find this heterogeneity in, in, um, in impacts across communes, does it actually share a common structure across outcome variables? Yeah, is it the case that the factors that explain the heterogeneity are consistently the same across places and across outcomes? Yeah. Um, or are they very context-specific um, and, and outcome-specific, yeah? which would very much complicate policy prescriptions once again? You know, it could be that some communes have the characteristics where 
you know, everything works well, all the outcomes, um, um, all the, the all the different outcomes you look at have have good impacts, or it could be that it depends on uh, it's very different from one commune to the other. Okay, the the project that we uh, evaluate is a rural roads rehabilitation project. Um, its objective was to link communities with markets, develop local markets, and reduce poverty that way. Um, the project um, stipulated specifically that it could only rehabilitate roads, um, rural roads, and that no new roads could be built, so no, no road building. Um, as an aside, we, we also, in, in other work, looked, looked at whether this was the case and, and the issue of fungibility. You know, could we say, could we actually find that there was evidence that the project had done what it said it did. Yeah, so using impact evaluation techniques and comparing with the comparison areas, we find evidence of the project. You know, did it actually rehabilitate it, the kilometers that it said it did? And, and was there a differential impact as opposed to you know, other money um, being displaced to go to the non-project areas and so on? And we, we found that, that yes, um, there's, there's evidence that, you know, um, that that the project did do what it did, what it uh, claimed it did. However, rather than just rehabilitate roads, there was certainly some road building as well. So when you look at the kilometers built and rehabilitated, they accord well with what the project said it did. However, they certainly built some some of the roads. So so you see uh, fungibility in the sense of of road building as opposed to just rehabilitation. Um, Finally, the, the, the road links were um, selected based on some, you know, ridiculous, uh, the, the costs had to be less than 15,000 per kilometer, population served at least 300 per kilometers. Um, that's pretty much applies to every single road link, you know, except in, in some mountainous areas. But of course, there was a stipulation in the project that that um, if it was very mountainous and there was a high share of ethnic minorities, you could do those roads too. So basically, um, there's, they could do whatever roads that, that uh, they wanted. I mean, it's, it's uh, very much a black box. You, we, based on um, the project documents, you don't get any sense of how places were, how road links were actually selected. 